Uh, welcome everybody to Bullseye Projects for our, this is actually our second panel discussion since we launched with our new name, Bullseye Projects. Uh, so thank you all for coming out on this day. Uh, I'm here to introduce, or my name is Michael Endo to begin with, for those of you that don't know me. I'm the curator here, and I'm excited to have the three artists for the exhibition that's currently up, Origins. Uh, we have Anna Mozowski, uh, originally from Germany, who has <coughs> basically done residencies at every place you can do a glass residency, including the Creative Glass Center of America, Toyama City Institute, Pittsburgh Glass Center, the National Glass Center in the UK, and most recently at the Bullseye Resource Center in the Bay Area. And it was in that, during that residency that she started to develop the techniques that she used in the work that you can see on the exhibition. It is also the work for which that she won the Technology Advancing Glass Award from the Glass Art Society. And now she is currently a graduate candidate at the University of Washington in Seattle. Matt Saws, uh, born in Rhode Island, undergraduate and graduate from the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, win, has won numerous awards, including the Yuda Kuni Franz Memorial Award, the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Grant, and most recently the International Glass Prize Residency for which you went to Lommel for mm. a residency that completed at the end of July. Uh, Abby Spring, our Portland resident, uh, graduated from the Maine College of Art in painting and uh, mounted several successful painting exhibitions here in Portland with Chambers, Ga Chambers Gallery. Um, and uh, upon later, it's decided to go back to school uh, in order to study glass at the Australian National University. Uh, she was recently a resident at the Oregon College of Art and Craft, and we're happy to have them here. So let's welcome them all, panel. So, so just as a brief introduction to the exhibition before we dive into this discussion, uh, the exhibition titled Origins, the, the main idea behind it was, were ideas themselves, or ideation, the I idea making process. And the three artists selected for the exhibition were chosen because all of them have these multifaceted practices uh, that include uh, both traditional craft techniques, digital technology, video performance. So it's really running the gamut, and all of them s seem to consistently change, or uh, their, their process continues to change. The glass world tends to draw people who focus in on one particular thing, and they do that very well over and over again. These three artists uh, are constantly evolving, and so, I was interested in how those different voices would come together into a singular exhibition. Um, so to get started, I wanted to think about or have structure this panel discussion thinking about the ideation process. So thinking about how ideas first get started, the experimentation that ensues, and then of course the evaluation that takes place. Um, I have three basic, th those three basic prompts to go through, but I invite the panelists to also ask questions amongst themselves, and also you in the audience if you're interested in uh, continuing a particular discussion, we'll, uh, we can take questions from the audience throughout. So, but I'll go ahead and get started, and maybe we'll start with Abby and go uh, down the line and have each of you answer the first question. Um, the first one has to do with ideation and uh, I was curious about your relationship to material and how whether or not the material informs the idea or the idea informs the material. I think the only, is this is close enough, there we go. Um, I think it's both. Um, for me, it's sort of like a feedback loop. Um, I think you know, I've been making things long enough that it just, I can't really remember the chicken or the egg part of the, the story. But um, most recently, I started with a painting to glass, um, was a fairly big transition. And I was working in glass doing um, sort of uh, complementary colored paintings that created this sense of depth that, so there was like a tactile sort of depth you could almost feel when you looked at the work, at least that's what I thought. And so it was sort of like being in a cloud, and so I got interested in the idea of real depth, and that's what led me to glass. So that was where the material came in. And so then, you know, working in glass, I got very caught up in a in trying to make the glass pieces look like 
the painted pieces, but that sort of removed one of the essential parts of what the painting process had become, which was this repetitive mark making. And so after years of doing this, sort of making them like this other stuff that I've been doing and using some depth, but not really, you know, sort of treating it like it was paint, I approached, or I guess like it was paint, um, I just decided at some point, like, well, this is just driving me crazy, and I'm going to just jump off in a new direction and do some work for myself, whatever it is, and I'm going to focus on mark making and process. And so that's when I started doing the pieces on paper and just found like going back to the repetitive mark making and process was really, really important to me. And also, you know, there's a lot of struggle with glass because, you know, people don't want bubbles or they don't want this or they don't want that or they don't want it to be what it is. And I really believe sort of in the inherent, appreciating the inherent qualities in a material, which with glass is partially its transparency is one of the things that drew me to it, but also it's a regularity. So I use the rough side of the glass and like drip enamels down that and where it creates weird craters and explosions and patterns and then I interact with that. So it's, it's like a, a process of in, interaction and I think that that's what I like about it. So. Do you still find yourself painting as well? Or oh, just, yeah, okay. yeah. I back my, yes. But um, mainly I paint, do these paintings on paper right now. Um, but I started a big one on canvas just to see what it would be like. And, um, and I always go back to, like, don't tell anyone, but I paint the landscape sometimes. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> All right, Matt? Let's see, my turn. Um, well, for me, the, the idea is almost entirely sublimated to material process. Um, I uh, Generally, when I'm making things, I approach it without any known goal at all. It's all a process of discovery. Um, and it first starts with just experimenting with material to figure out something exciting that it does, something fun that I can play around with. And then that kind of generates a series of experiments um, with that process. And that traditionally, or uh, not traditionally, but typically, um, that involves just kind of setting up a cause and effect relationship within a certain framework. So for a lot of the pieces here, they're all made from hexagons or squares or triangles, uh, just kind of arranged in a certain way and then subjected to whatever trauma the process uh, produces in them. And, uh, and then the result is this transition from that flat two-dimensional pattern into a three-dimensional shape um, under the forces of whatever physics is, you know, whether it's inflation or stretching or whatever else is going on. Uh, and that typically produces its own form. Um, often those forms are not ones that you necessarily want to keep. There's an awful lot of failure involved in that. Um, and you can take the same pattern and do it four times and get four different shapes from it. Um, so then I kind of select out of, out of what comes out of that. Uh, and what I'm kind of looking for is that it's really a very traditional kind of definition of form uh, as, a, as a finished functional object that you can read. Um, and that uh, because all of them are generated in this kind of physical way, much like the way things grow, the way things develop um, that you see in, in the natural world on a regular basis, you get these um, forms that are both very kind of familiar because they they seem a lot like a lot of things that are that are around, but they're also a little bit odd and a little bit strange. Um, and I kind of select for the forms that that, that fall into that kind of definition of um, of beauty that I think is really kind of a very traditional thing that happens in in art. Do you find with the inflated forms, are you often thinking about a three-dimensional form to begin with and then start structuring the flat? I typically have an idea of what will come out of it. Um, the best ones don't look anything like what I drew when I started. Um, and it's, it's the surprise when you, when you get something that you weren't expecting. That's what I'm always looking for and that's what makes me happy. Um, and that's true of, of the process as well as the, the kind of finished form, you know, all of the most of the processes I use come out of some moment of surprise or discovery or something. I'm like, oh, we can do this? I didn't know I did that. 
Um, could you could you briefly describe the process? You don't need to go into full mm, detail, but just mm-hmm. so people are aware of what's happening on those. Um, there's there's two different sets of or there's two different types of works out there, um, and they're both made from flat glass. They're both made from bullseye sheet. Um, and one is an inflation process, uh, and the other is a stretching. Um, so for the inflation, I'll build a pattern that's a number of kind of interconnected envelopes uh, in, the, in the flat glass and fuse it in the kiln. And while it's hot, while it's about 1600, you pull it out and put compressed air to it, and it inflates in about 20 seconds, and you either get something good or you don't. And you throw it in the annealer as quickly as you can, and hopefully it survives. Um, and then the other one uh, is kind of a stretching process where you build up patterns that are kind of like a collapsed set of paper dolls a little bit or, or origami that's all crushed down. And then uh, I have a kiln with a crane inside it so I can attach it to that and attach it to some weights and while it's hot, just <whistles> unfold it. Um, and I just kind of, of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he built it, so yeah. you're going to have to have some serious conversation um, <laughs> about time management. <laughs> time management. So you get a lot of variations of, you know, I mean, the same pattern at three different temperatures produces three things that are completely different because the glass behaves a little bit differently. It folds differently. Um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of kind of steps, especially with the inflation, where you can clearly see... Um, it's hot enough to bend, but not stretch. It's hot enough to stretch and then inflate, you know, whether it'll take a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional curve well. Um, and then it's hot enough to pop. Um, but so anyway, I don't, yeah. that, I don't know if that helps explain yeah. anything. And if anybody has any questions, just There's also some great me. videos that Matt has of the process that I recommend looking at. Um, so, Anna, maybe we could move on to you. The, the original question was about the relationship between material and idea. What comes first, or how do they inform each other? Well, I, I really feel that for the pieces that are in the exhibition here, um, that I kind of uh, did the opposite that I usually do when I work, where I was. it started really off as a frustration project. It started off with me being frustrated with the technique put to bear where you usually make a big plaster mold and then you have to keep it wet and all packed up and then you have to try to get into it to pack it with glass powders. Um, but you can't have undercuts, you can't have certain complexities in the shapes. And I was just really frustrated having to work in a mold and making multiples is just an enormous m- amount of work that doesn't seem like it's worth it. Um, And I really was thinking about how I could um, take that process of pot de verre away from a mold. And so usually that's not what I do. I I don't necessarily um, take a technique and think about it. I usually um, think about more ideas that are attached to um, different craft um, traditions, to our tradition of perception of different um, uh, phenomena or um, just the way we the way we make things and how we look at things the way they are made and then make a decision about what they are um, and f- so for this I feel it's kind of like taking taking it from the opposite side um, and I really felt that once I started working the way I did so what what ha- what happened was that I thought was thinking back to the time when I was an undergrad, and there was a ceramic de- department where I studied in Helsinki, and people would take textiles and dip them, or fabrics or paper, and dip them in porcelain slip, and then put them in a kiln and fire them, and so the paper would turn into, into ceramic. And I thought about, why can't I just make some form of glass paste and dip natural materials in the glass paste and then fire it and it would turn into glass. And it started really off with like, I did a test at Bullseye where I tried to grow glass crystals by making crystal solutions and mixing glass powders in it and hoping that the crystals would pick up the glass and then 
in the kiln magically turn into crystals, which of course didn't happen, but it's a, um, it's a good, <laughs> nice idea. <laughs> yeah, right? I thought really so nice too. Idea. <laughs> so I'm working kind of a similar way like Matt does. I do a lot of experimentation and I'm really interested in just kind of um, learning from the material and figuring out what it can give me and what maybe I've been told that it can't do, but really it's able to do it. If you just take away the expectations that you would naturally have on the material. Like a crack in glass is nothing bad as long as you want it, right? It's just that you have to like make your head blank and go like, okay, I have no preconceptions. I'm just gonna start off blank and I'm gonna look at what I get here. And um, so the crystal growing is kind of this like, yeah, it was probably set up for failure in the beginning already, but the same thing you could think of the process that I've been using here, that you would just kind of think of that would never work. And then it does. And it has kind of happened for me very often throughout the time that I've been working in glass. Um, and so I started off dipping sponges and textiles into these kind of glass solutions that I'd made and fired them and then figured out very soon that they would just fall over as they got soft. So I started adding some kind of support back in and then started really making more and more complex constructions and cardboard to um, apply this uh, paste to. So I feel that the forms that I am showing here in the exhibition are really a result of how the cardboard behaves and how just basic um, construction behaves and not so much about what I um, kind of apply to what I want it to be. That sort of leads into the other parts that I'm thinking about is this idea of experimentation and Maybe we can kind of, I know that Matt and that all of you touched on that a little bit well in your original responses, but we can continue that conversation of as you're thinking about, a lot, uh, you know, most of the works out there, all three of you are using a traditional craft technique in a way, you know, pat de verre, fusing in your case and painting in your case, and then combining those with either a, a different material like adding glass to it or, or 3D printing in your cases or deciding to inflate a piece that normally people would be fine with it fused in the kiln. <laughs> so I'm just wondering how you uh, think about or how you come to these conclusions to juxtapose these different techniques and materials or how you decide to combine those things. How do you arrive at those? Maybe we'll start with Anna. Yeah, I think it's a lifestyle question. I think that's just kind of how I always go about everything in life. I've never had an easy time fitting in anywhere or doing what someone told me to. And I think that's reflected in my work. When someone say, oh, this won't work, then I have to try it to make sure that it really doesn't. And I have to find out if it only doesn't work because um, it is. It does. It might not work for exactly that one process that someone had envisioned when we talked about it in the beginning what I was doing, but it might work perfectly fine for what I want out of it. So I feel like I've always kind of gone at everything in my life with this idea that I have to try it in order to understand it, and I have to see it in order to believe it. And I think that has led to the type of work that I'm making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, poking the bear is always a good idea. <laughs> um, it, it, it actually is, yes. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it, glass always has more answers than you do, um, and particularly with my stuff, I'm always, I'm always following the material, and the experimentation process is the only way to get really direct feedback. Um, and glass tells you right away when it doesn't want to do something. It's just, um, and it's really everything ends up from the initial process development to the final form of the pieces is all kind of in partnership with the glass. Um, and the glass always has a little bit more say in it than I do if things work out properly. Um, so it's just a constant amount of experimentation. I get bored easily too, so there's always the next thing to try out. That all sounds very familiar. Um, the things that you're not seeing, most of this work is from 2013, and that was kind of a while ago, because of the last two years I've been doing like stuff that people just keep telling me I can't do. And they may be right, because I haven't really succeeded yet, but I am getting closer, and most my most recent experiment um, was so large that it pulled my half-ton crane out of the floor. And I'm still going to figure that one out. But yeah, I mean, it's like trying to figure out a light enough mold-making material mm -hmm. so you can do what you want. And it's that is a 
if I could just stay down that rabbit hole forever and trying yeah. to come up occasionally and actually make stuff that, you know, is meditative instead of just frustrating or, you know, allowing myself to have a little balance there and like being in the process, which is important to me on some level. It's just like going back to like this kind of what I, is like meditation for me and these other processes, which I love like building a kiln with a crane in it or whatever, or, you know, enabling yourself to do stuff. But it is a whole, it, to me, they're not quite integrated. I, and I'd love to kind of find a way where I could integrate them a little more closely, I think. But it's, yeah, I love expanding what the materials can do and finding, you know, researching this and that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I feel like there's something that's really important. If I hear how, how, how old your work is and in relationship to how long your processes are. I think that relates to um, our work as well, that if you do that type of experimentative work, it takes two or three or four years to uh, produce a successful project. Right. And that's really something um, that we are not used to anymore necessarily um, in, an, in a kind of lifestyle environment that doesn't allow for things to take a long time, right. but really processes. And, this, and it goes along with like understanding the material and understand the technique you're using, but then also understanding why are you interested in it. Like there's this whole other dimension in your head that you really don't know why you want to do something. And then understanding as a person what interests you about that particular thing and why can't you stop doing it? Other than the right, fact that, that people <laughs> told you you couldn't. Yeah. Which is a huge <laughs> motivator for me. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like um, there is a lot of time investment and, and energy. And, it's, uh, it, and as frustrating as it is, I think it's also so rewarding in the end when you come out of, of it with something that you never saw would happen. Right. right. Speaking of that, all three of you have used done video in the past or sculptural work plus flat work, this variety of things. How do you know whether what form the final piece or idea is supposed to take? Is it when how do you know when it's supposed to be a video or when it's supposed to be an object? Or in Anna's case, you know, sometimes it's both. Uh, I'm thinking of the handmade mm -hmm. piece where it's you need both of those things. I mean, Matt, your experimental glass pieces with video following drips across the floor, not that we're seeing that here, but how do you know whether or not these ideas are going to be an object, a performance, or a video? Well, the, um, the kind of really exciting part for a lot of the, a lot of the work that I do is, is when it's happening, it's making it, and it's, um, there's usually some moment of transformation when it's, you know, when it's going from hot to cold or when it's going from two-dimensional to three-dimensional, and that's the thing that's really exciting to me and that's what um, I think people get most excited about when they when they talk to me about my work so that's usually what I try to um, get across and a lot of times that ends up being video but uh, I tend to try to treat the videos more as documentation or a record rather than a performance or a narrative there are a couple that are kind of I decided to try like telling a story um, but uh, but for the most part it's just kind of really kind of raw recording just of what happened and it's that kind of excitement of this thing doing whatever it does that uh, is the important thing to me. And it's a little different than performance. It's just kind of um, the only way of communicating that event to people that weren't there. It's really kind of a, you know, a, a, a specific time and a place. So it's a specific event and how do you record that and how do you get across the things that are important to you in that. Um, and a lot of times, there's nothing left afterwards um, of whatever I've done. Some of the processes lend themselves to this kind of further examination of the results of it, where they, they produce something that's kind of the end result of this physics um, of um, space and time and pressure and whatever, that you can examine and kind of see this story that's still embodied in it. Um, and those are kind of successful pieces. Um, but for the most part, most of the things that I really enjoy just end up in little bits all over the floor. So video is kind of the way to get it, <laughs> to get it out there. Uh, are they happenings then? They're not happenings, no. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure? Yeah, because it's not I the 70s. I think so. It's not, the, it's, not the, it's not the 70s anymore. <laughs> right. yeah. People still try happenings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
okay. Um, well, you said a couple things that I thought. Yeah, the, I, I think about um, recording process a lot in my work and how, um, I'm not even sure, what was the question? Because I've about to go off on a tangent it's, here. I like tangents. Um, uh, the main <laughs> question was thinking about how do you know what form the idea is supposed to take. And right. as you, I mean, uh, last time I visited your studio, you were like making huge stacks of sticks. Sticks, right, right. And, and, and those are, are both performative and um, finished things, ultimately. And, and then I'm working on casting them in glass for some crazy reason. But um, yeah, I think it's, I think the sort of backbone of what I do is recording process. It's like the, the essence of what I do is this sort of meditative mark making or stick breaking or whatever it is, scratching holes in at, you know, sheetrock, it could be anything. But I find that to be very meditative and kind of f focusing. And so the stick stacks are just these huge, sta there's probably photographs of them over there, these stacks of sticks. And the final thing that looks like a huge kind of weird stretched out eagle's nest is a just a record of the process and I made those in originally was making those in an environment where people didn't get to engage with art art making or art practices I was doing them along bike trails near homeless encampments and in the middle of the woods near where homeless people were live well I guess you're not completely homeless if you're living in a camper in the woods but anyway <laughs> sort of displaced people that aren't going to go to an art gallery so that becomes performative in a way and interactive in a way that's important and I don't to me, the video of something like that would be another step away from it, whereas the stick stack in and of itself, you know, it's gonna fall over eventually, but it's it's there and it is a record. And that's what these pieces sort of ended up becoming the work that's in the show, the sort of newer work in particular, became about that, you know, sort of archeological mark making, responding to the texture of the glass and turning it, which I did do, the collaborative piece is a piece that I did sort of performatively with a bunch of people at the Museum of Contemporary Craft where I had each day I put a new piece of glass out, they would respond to it, then I would respond to the glass that they put out and then eventually ended up with like, you know, a bunch of layers of glass. I threw some out that didn't that I didn't like and um, <laughs> ended up firing it into a finished piece. So there's a performative element to that and also just like the interacting with the process part of it. Um, and I've done video stuff, you know, I've had video performances, but they've always been more documents and not ends in them themselves. I, to me, to do a video art would be like a different, it's just a different medium that I don't know that much about yet. So, although I did take filmmaking, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can work on a trade. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I feel like I'm right now with my work in um, in a very new uh, phase, going to grad school. It's just um, overwhelming and often throws you off your beaten tracks. And that was why I went there. That's what I wanted. And I felt there was there's something in my work that I first now understood when I'm looking back at my website and seeing all the pieces that I'd made in the last four or five years. They all have this kind of underlying quality that I'm trying to extract now much more than ever that is um, that is a really deep interest of mine in kind of capturing transitions, capturing stages of in-betweenness between um, position, um, having a certain level of ambiguity in the work that I'm making. And doing that has um, kind of led me a lot away from the glass and I now make a lot of, um, I'm very open to any material and um, I did, I just recently completed a kind of strict video piece installation work um, and I have a couple of more ideas coming that are going the same way because the video can add this different quality of a really um, straightforward image making which um, is different in the, in, to anything else that I've been making. So, um, and right now I am, I'm working with folded paper and painting and plaster, which is a 
very different direction as well. Um, so I, f I don't know, I don't have a, I don't feel that it's difficult for me to to just kind of jump into using any other material and just kind of grabbing on my way what feels appropriate for whatever idea I have. Um, but it's still very new for me to use video like as a to make a video piece because I did the same thing before with the glass where I would um, use the video as a recording of the process because if you make work that's about the process it's a time based thing right. so uh, using a video which is a time based storytelling makes a lot of sense because it does what you need so I'm always kind of just using whatever I need to convey what I want to say and that's kind of then what directs me into choosing whatever material I want to use. Like the last piece I made was a gigantic room um, that was entirely gold leafed on the inside. And the reason I went to gold leaf was because um, gold has this representation of being good and evil at the same time in the Bible. Um, they made the golden calf they worshipped, which was the impersonation of the evil at the same time. Um, all the saints have golden halos and gold is wealth and it's luck. So it kind of like goes both ways and I wanted to have a material that has these very strong um, oppositions attached to it because in my work, if you want to have a certain ambiguity and, um, and show positions in between oppositions, you need very strong um, imagery to use with that or strong material that can kind of reinforce that position. So that's why I use gold, and it's not that I'm going to use gold for the rest of my life. But I really just kind of pick from whatever feels appropriate. I just want to remind the audience, if you guys have any questions, you guys can chime in. How do you know when you're finished? It's about 5 o'clock. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, for me, a lot of the, the pieces are kind of experiments that operate within a certain limit, and when it's over, it's, um, it's either time to try it again, or, uh, or it's, or it's uh, time to go do something else because it's answered all the, I've gotten all the answers out of it that I want. Um, but when a piece, it's more about when you decide a piece is a success, I think, because until, until you get to a point where you've got something that you really like, you just have to keep poking it. Um, or opening side doors until something happens the way you want it to. Um, and that's usually when it's unexpected enough that it's something that it's its own person and it's separate from me, that I look at something and I don't necessarily recognize all of it. Um, then it's uh, gotten far enough away from my own head to be a success and to be its own entity and to, for me to move on to the next thing. Yeah, I feel also that there's a certain amount of questions you ask to everything you're making. And once the piece has answered for you enough of these questions and maybe starts asking its own questions, then it's kind of where you can let go of it. When you don't know what to tell it to do anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I mean, that, is, his, that question ties into one of the last things I wanted to talk about was this, uh, this, the role of evaluation in particular. Failure, and I know so you've talked about that a little bit, but you know, how how is on failure to see is an important aspect of the creative process, but nobody really talks about it. So I was hoping the three of you could talk about failure. A I should have bit. taken a photograph of the pile of stuff outside my house <laughs> and shown it to you. I'd <laughs> give you a good idea of my mm -hmm. failure rate. <laughs> Uh, geez, now I guess I'm going to have to keep going. Um, <laughs> yeah, failure is definitely part of it. I mean, it's like you, but the, the part of it is, you know, when you have a preconceived notion about where you're going with something, or you're trying to, you know, redo something you did before, or something similar, or do you guys want more water? You good? No, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, I think that it, things will easily become failures, you know, if you're con trying to, but I think when you kind of, for me, I always say you, excuse me, when I'm trying to move forward with something, it's letting it be what it is more than me trying to kind of force it into something. And, and, that, and it's sort of a balance between those things that 
allows some of the failures to actually be new things, and then some of them just are, I, you know, actually they're pieces that may not even be failures. I just get sick of them, and I just, you know, put it, lean it against the wall, and it's, it's going to stay there until for a while. I had a, one painting I used as a coffee table for three years, and then I was like, <laughs> now I get it. And so I finished it, and I sold it within a week. So it was like, it just sometimes the failures are just, they're just lessons that I haven't quite figured out what the lesson is. And, you know, I think just in terms of commodity, like having the materiality of this, all this, you know, glass essentially right now is what I've got lots of. Um, because it can't just throw it in the recycling bin. Um, and don't want to. Uh, you know, I don't know if I'll use those again in some other form, but I, I think that it probably will, you know, go on to be something else. But I think that failure is just sort of a, I don't know. I mean, it's not, failure isn't really failure. It's just how you, I learn. It's like, you know, if I don't push myself, I'm not going to learn anything new. I'm not going to discover something. And, and to, what somebody was giving me a hard time recently. It's like, you just never know what you're doing when you, you, you're working in the studio. You're like, it's so chaotic. It's like, you don't plan ahead. I'm like, well, you know, if I knew how to do this, I wouldn't be trying to figure it out. You know, it's kind of like, if there was, if anyone knew how to do this, I'd already have read about it. It would be done, but I'm doing something different and new and it's you know, I don't know, maybe the first 15 times it's not going to work, but then maybe it will, or maybe I'll just be like, wow, this is ridiculous. But... Yeah, the only real failure is an easy success. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you if you draw something out and you try it out and it comes out exactly like you planned, then you didn't learn anything. Right. You know, it's just, you know, that's a disappointment. Failure is always the, the teacher. I mean, yeah, failure is about 90% of my time. Um, but it's always the obstacle that makes you take another path. Um, and it's the thing that makes you think again and think again and think again and think again. Um, and uh, if it wasn't for failure, I would never get anything other than what I already have. Right, you know, exactly. Just stay inside your own head. Yeah, I think that that's kind of what defines artists in a lot of ways, that there's a certain curiosity for everything that you want to take it apart, you want to understand it, you want to learn something new, you want to be engaged. and. Um, without failure, there's no way of, of success. I mean, then you wouldn't even feel success if you wouldn't have felt the failure before. Yeah. But I still, I have a very low tolerance for <laughs> failure. <laughs> oh. I'm I mean, sorry. It's, yeah. <laughs> it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of, out of you because if you've been, especially um, Matt is my husband, so when I help him make his work, I just can't handle it because my work is more successful in the making at least um, than his and going through we had a piece that we both worked together on for one month straight just the physical making of the object and so is and it, if we I still mean, have it we in still have it. We, don't, we didn't throw it away after it <laughs> failed because we were so attached to it. But that, that amount of time, and it was really like 15 hours in the studio every day, and we were both so tired, and Matt would like work until 3 in the morning and then get up at 8 to continue, and we were so burned out. And then we put it in a kiln, and within 15 minutes, it's ruined. And you just sit there, and you're like, no, not really? Seriously? Like, it was more than everything for this? Yeah. <laughs> it took, like, six hours ramp up, and then 50 minutes off. But so for me, these moments are enormously frustrating. And I think sometimes I do just feel like, you know, why don't I just go and lay in the sun and read a book and have a good time and get a nine to five job and just have a really easy life? <laughs> because I, for me, it's really frustrating and I, it makes me want to give up a lot of times. Um, but then again, I've tried a lot of times to have a job and it doesn't work <laughs> because it gets too boring for me. Uh, so I kind of need it. It's like kind of this, this failure junkie. You kind of need it in order to feel something and to feel good. And I, I, I really think that um, the failure is the most important to any um, project that I've ever started. 
Yeah, fortunately, I've been really lucky. Well, most of my failures in the last year have been before I got things in the kiln, <laughs> so there was no glass involved, <laughs> just like molds blowing mm -hmm. up and falling over and just self-destructing. I, I guess that's a failure blessing, but um, yeah, the failures, it's... And as other people are just like, you know, my friends come over and they aren't artists and they like see this huge destroyed mold on the floor and they're like, oh gosh, that's so sad. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I just do another one. I learned how not to do it. So, you know. But I think that there again, we come back to kind of this cultural um, idea of life having to be a success. Right. But like right. in and the e end. And easy. The and art easy. Is life easy. Has, it right. has to be e easy and has to be successful and we all going to have to be great and always on top of everything like truth is no one is ever on top of anything it feels like personally for oneself and it looks for others like you are maybe but there's always this there's every day you kind of go up you get up and you start doing again and you never know how it's going to turn out today and you know I just kind of feel like it's a good thing to learn that that failure is more in life than the success in the end it's the fun part yeah <laughs> Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, so you're working in, a, in a, this highly material-based art form. Uh, do you find yourself starting out from that place, or do you gravitate back towards it? Like, do you do you see glass making or gla working with glass as a as a, as where you start, and then maybe other materials or other methods? kind of stream in as you walk away, as you walk out from that point, or do you find yourself problem solving and coming back to, to materials? Does that make sense? <laughs> it makes because sense, but I'm not sure to, I can answer are it. Are you trying to escape your, your natural material, or are you trying to expand from, or are you trying to come home material. and find yourself gravitating back towards it when you try to escape that? The, the importance of glass is always kind of arbitrary to me. Um, making art is just a way of kind of investigating the world around you all the time and poking stuff to find out what it does. Um, so I've done a bunch of things, or a few things at least, that aren't glass-based, but glass does so many different things and it's such a complex material. Um, and it also tends to give you very strict answers right away, so it's a great <laughs> thing to um, experiment with. Um, I've just never gotten bored of it, you know? So you just keep poking at it and there's always more waiting there for you. Um, and it's also something that at this point is very familiar to me and I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of like four steps down the road of, of doing things because I, you know, I have a, at this point I have a very large library of things I can do with glass and, and things that I think it might do or things that that it may do or solutions to that particular problem. Um, so I end up making a lot of things in glass kind of almost for lack of anything better to make them in. Um, and it also has a whole bunch of virtues once it's a finished thing, you know, just optically, physically, it's, it's a really kind of enchanting thing. Um, I used to really love wood, uh, but, you know, wood is also very difficult. And people don't pay as much for wood. <laughs> anyway, um, so does that answer? Yeah. Any? <laughs> Essentially, yeah. Um, well, it, it uh, it's something that um, whatever material I'm working with, I like it to kind of lead me places. Um, so you always kind of follow it. It around whether it's wood or whether it's glass or whether it's something else it's kind of that inherent investigation of the particular physicality of something and how it works and how it works in relation to the rest of the world um, and for now glass is kind of my default starting point I think. I think uh, Anna you've said in the past that glass was something that you could push against. Yeah. And so yeah, I, f I really feel that um, there's no other material that uh, transforms so often and so well and so rapidly. Um, and that's kind of the reason why I liked it always. And also because it has this whole range 
that it can go through from being a transparent material to being an opaque, a colored material, being a matte or a shiny material. Like it has so many directions it can go and nothing else can do it so well. Um, so that that's kind of a reason why why I like it because I really have this like um, dialogue with it where where it tells me something and I tell it something, um, and that's kind of yeah that's kind of a for me it's 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 just been really fascinating to to have this conversation. I think what you were talking about earlier about gold having that sort of intense positive negative you know di dichromatic or whatever you want to call it sort of inherent dichotomy um, is sort of why I like glass because it is you know a mass produced thing we see it everywhere all the time and yet it's very precious it's you know we make it into these kind of crazy fragile precious objects and um, there's that dichotomy, and I, I like the inherent dichotomy. And also for what I'm doing right now, I think it's it is sort of it is home for this body of work of wanting to do work that's a re record of process. Because I I've done work like that for a long time with opaque things, and then grinding through it and de exposing the layers. And I was doing that with glass too, but I really like the transparency and that I can, you know, have a first layer and then see it still and then make the second layer while looking at the first layer and responding to it. So it's sort of become like very important to that process. You know, I have other processes that I'm engaging in simultaneously, but for that it's it's critical right now. So Yeah, I I don't I still feel that um, for me personally I've gone away from glass in the last year and I felt for at least two or three years a really strong wish to expand from because I started with everything from glass making and working in glass and learning um, art making and thinking through this one material and I really wanted to expand from there and I don't think that the reason for that was less because of the material itself but much more because of the glass community as a very limiting, um, narrow-minded kind of um, path to go down that I never felt really I fit into with the type of work that I was making. And for me, it was really just trying to, um, not having to um, live up to these expectations that are, that are within that kind of community. And I think that was more the reason that I just kind of went off to a different path than the material itself. I, I love glass. It's a it's a great material. Iris. Yeah. Um, any of you been uh, found influence from other disciplines other than art uh, that has affected your work, or have you collaborated with non-artists in any of the work that you've done? I certainly have. Um, I, 2012, and that was also a project, that I finished it in 2012, but I had been working on it for at least two years before that. It was a sound project where I was trying to uh, visualize vibrations and certain uh, different ways of, uh, ways of frequencies. And I started off with working with a mathematician um, that would be able to um, Object, 3D scanned objects turn these curves back in into numbers. And then I worked with a, with an, a good friend of mine who is a um, physicist who helped me build um, one of the vibrating speaker cone apparatuses. And then I ended up, the end of the project was that I worked with two different composers. Um, one is a professor at, um, Oh, I always get that name. University of California, Berkeley, um, in the music department, and he is the director of the new, um, new music and media technology area. And his specialty was what I was doing. And he was co he had composed the sound for a piece um, after I gave him a list of frequencies, and he had himself um, made this program that could um, single out all these frequencies. 
So I did do collaborate with them a lot. And then um, in a way, I think they, I, I do look a lot at um, different scientific researchers. Um, I started working on a project that I never finished with where I was in contact with the Northwest Seismographic Society, Seismological Society, and um, they were giving me information. And yeah, it, it does, it, it interests me a lot, but it's difficult because you have to convince them that they get something out of it and that you are gonna not just waste their time. And that's the harder part. It's really hard to find this type of collaboration. And I think it's the easiest to do through designated residency programs that do that type of, um, that encourage the type of conversation between different disciplines. Otherwise, it's really, really hard to do. I, um, I almost never collaborate uh, when it comes to art. Uh, I do in other, a lot of other things. You know, I have various groups that I, that I work with. Um, but when it comes to art, I mean, I don't even know where I'm going. And, and trying to do it with somebody else is, um, is a little bit of a, of a, me and Anna almost never collaborate. One of us works for the other one, whatever. whatever. I'm either working on her projects or she's helping me with mine. Um, but uh, I was originally a design student. Um, and kind of one of the things about design is that it's meant to, it's part of the rest of the world. You know, you're, you're designing for industry or you're designing for an application where people will actually use it. So you're meant to kind of mesh with everything else around you in a way that art isn't really required to. Art is pretty much just about thinking um, and thinking physically. Uh, but that kind of idea of it having a place in the rest of my everyday life is something that I think about uh, all the time when I'm when I'm making things, um, and I pay a lot of attention to biologists in particular and, and physics, science, science. <laughs> the collaboration. Um, I was part of a performance art group a long, long time ago, and that kind of was enough collaboration for me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we performed every week, and it was completely insane. And it was really interesting, but it's like being in a rock and roll band. You've got too many personalities, you know, and it, things never kind of got focused. I mean, some of them were incredible performances, but there, some of them were terrible because it was just like, yeah, it was just too much. So, yeah, that was pretty much made me, that was like one of the deciding factors in going to study painting was yeah. that trying to get out of that kind of um, thing. And so there was, you know, that was collaborative. And then since then I haven't done much collaboration. I really like to be alone um, a lot. And I spend most of my time alone in the studio. And that's where I want to be. I like... I do connect with people occasionally. Um, I got in touch with a neuroscientist for some images of neurons for some pieces, and you know, he sent me a bunch of images and some sound recordings and stuff, and so I sent him a piece. And so I'll do that kind of collaboration that's very low key, but, and I, some of the more formal residencies appeal to me, but uh, yeah, I, I think I'd need it to be a pretty formal structure at this point. Yeah, so. and then it, I don't know how you define collaboration because I feel that what I was doing with the musicians, it wasn't necessarily collaboration, it was me asking for a favor and right. them being open to it. And a real collaboration is more like this sharing of idea and, and kind of making a piece together. Yeah. And I don't, never got that sense that this was what was happening. Um, and I feel that's, that's a hard thing for a lot of artists. Some people are made for it, but for a lot of people, it's, you have such a strong head already. So like getting someone else in there can, can be a tough thing. And also what you're saying, like this wanting to, liking to be alone, I have no problem not speaking for two or three or four days in a row and just not being bothered by anything. And I think that's, that's a problem for that idea of collaboration. Yeah. I did do a collaboration with an uh, artist here in Portland, TJ Norris, and I did a couple collaborations. And they were Richard Spear like them, so mm -hmm. that was good. Um, but it that was kind of too, like, oh, well, that was another little thing. And then this, there is a piece in there that was a collaboration, but it was a collaboration in such a controlled way that it was like, I'm taking 
what you did that I like and throwing out the rest of it. So that wasn't really a collaboration. <laughs> that was like me being a dictator. <laughs> so, that's the kind of collaboration I like. <laughs> Kill workers are fundamentally antisocial. Yeah, I think so. Back here, Amy? It's kind of like the priesthood, isn't it? It's something that gets thrust on you. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You were called to it. Your family <laughs> sends you off to the nunnery. That's pretty much what happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really tough question. I mean, I feel like I'm still very young. Um, and I feel I'm just getting started. I do too. <laughs> I mean, I'm young, longer, younger than I am, luckily, but still, I... I never had any idea what it's going to be like. I always had all these places that I wanted to go. I was like, when I started off as a student, I was like, what if I in my life get to like work next to this person or got, be invited to go to this place? Like Bullseye was a gallery I knew about from the beginning and sitting here now is like this whole weird thing that it actually happened, right? So there are these places that I wanted to see, places that I want to be involved in, that I want to be part in, people that I really wanted to meet. Um, so having that, there's no expectation, there's a wish for something, and that certainly happened. The other thing, of course, I don't think anyone can imagine what it, what it means to have this very, very insecure um, present and future and never knowing where it's going or what you're going to do or how long you can afford to pay the place that you're living in and what you're going to do with all of your stuff when you have to move and where you're going to go next. Can you ever have a family? Can you even just sustain having a pet? I mean, like, they're all, they're like these small Who's things. Who's going to pay your dental bills? Right? Yeah, I mean, and that I think it's is more the, the problem that artists talk plenty about and that's everyone's issue and that's um, something that I'm just figuring out personally if that's what I want or if my future is going to look very, very different than what I'm doing right now. And, if, and that's a decision about never not giving up art making, but do I want to make art making commercially or do I want to make art making for myself and don't care about what the rest of the world, how much they see of it and what's going on with it because it takes a certain pressure out of it that I don't have to live up to anymore and instead living somewhere in the countryside on a farm and having hopefully Matt have a job. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's worked for her so far. Right, uh, oh, right now we are planning on me having a job somewhere in the future, but we I are? think I, we are. Okay. I am. <laughs> I'm planning on having a job in the future. That's probably the statement about where I come from and where I am You're right the now. one who's supposed to be a success and sell work. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same thing. Um, there's also, there's only so many times in your life where you can just say, I never want to do that again. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a process of elimination. Um, and you end up working for yourself because you won't have anybody else. Um, and you get bored easily. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't I, I think for me, there was never really a point where it was, particularly to be where I am now, that it was a conscious decision. It's, um, it's what happens. It's a combination of stubbornness and bad luck. Um, but uh, I'm fairly happy with it. There is, yeah, there, there's an enormous amount of existential stress that goes along with it. But um, I can't imagine doing anything else for anybody else uh, for an extended period of time. Yeah, and I think also that that is the thing 
that Matt says that he just ended up where he is. I also just ended up where I am. And that has nothing to do with not having any um, objectives for the future, but you can't choose your path as an artist. I can't just say like, tomorrow I'm gonna have an exhibition and this and that gallery and point. Like when you have a different profession where you can just apply for something and you're gonna find a job and it's gonna be a certain path from there on, there is no, none of that to have a certain path. So you always just kind of get surprised when things work out and most of the time they just don't. You right. just have to be really tenacious. Well, I think it's, I'm kind of completely opposite. Like I, my mother is, has a master's degree in painting and there was no doubt ever that that's what I was gonna do and that's what I did. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I was in New York in the 80s and so I you know, saw the whole East Village kind of Julian Schnabel scene and didn't want to make art like that, so I went to a pretty traditional art school and just, you know, just kept plodding away at it. And, you know, then after that school, I went to Santa Fe and did pretty well there, made some stupid decisions, and um, it was basically, have, you know, living hand to mouth until mm -hmm. I got to Portland and then somehow managed to marry someone who actually does have a job and it's been <laughs> awesome. So, that's, that's but that, secret. <laughs> it made a huge difference, but it is, it's just mm -hmm. like, I, it was always, you know, speaking of existentialism, my existentialism teacher, I took some master's classes in existentialism, the teacher's like, you don't need to take this class. You could write these books. I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. But <laughs> he's like, choose something, anything. Dedicate your life to it. And I was like, well, I kind of already, you know, I know what that is. And so mm -hmm. it's just, that's what it was. And it's all, it's everything kind of comes back around to that. Well, that's what I'm going to do. Whatever allows me to keep making. It's whatever it is, that's the choice. Because I don't really have any other way of... You know, I don't have any great faith system that's going to guide me in my decision making other than be nice to people. And so it's, you know, you gotta, I've got to do something. So I'm just following that, and that's simple enough. Yeah, I think it's as much a refusal to stop as it is. It, I think that <laughs> is completely right. <laughs> exactly. Just tenacious. I think uh, Lonnie had a question. Do you guys want to answer first, or should I go? I okay. To That's okay. Yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, to expand on it, I think um, for me, it's been always hard when I when I started off working in glass. I just wanted to learn about that material at that point, and as I grew with my knowledge, I started thinking about other things, other ways of making, other materials, but. Whenever you work in glass and you um, you get different residencies or you go and having different exhibitions, they're designated for glass only, which is very particular for a material. They're not like they're, uh, they're painting they're painting shows, but then again, you have painting in, in other exhibitions included. Same sculpture is a word that expands to a much larger kind of way of making then glass art says that it's made in glass with glass. And then most of the galleries expect from you to make shiny stuff, to make things that are colorful, to make things that are easy sellable, and then making work where um, video is involved. And that doesn't just go for glass galleries. Generally, video having a gallery just put on a video screen on the wall is already a lot to ask. A lot of places just don't want to deal with things like this. And it's hard. Um, so it, I just kind of, and when I see, I went to the Glass Art Society conference this summer. Um, some of you might have been there. And the talks that were given there, they were never on any general topic that might be interesting for the larger community. It was individual artists giving talks about the individual work. And I feel that there's a certain amount of work where there is a lack of content um, and a lack of talking about anything else than just the one technique they're using. And I had 
this I, this kind of like frustration was for me there from the beginning, going to Pilchuck and seeing everyone blow goblets, where I'm like, why do you want to make another goblet that already exists within the other thousands of goblets? And I don't see where this is art, this is craft for me. And there was a certain division that I didn't feel was being supported strong enough in, in that type of community. Um, and also the interest of um, talking about something else than when you then glass and glass and glass. And that was, I want to talk about ideas. Yeah, I want go to, to talk, the College yeah. Art Association conference because mm -hmm. that is where you get ideas. Yeah. Yeah, you're not going to be in a closet with a bunch of specific glass subject people. Yeah, so, so for me it was, just, it was just being too much focused on technique and too little on why do we make what we make and why and if you ask people why they use this material, then it's just like, oh, because I like it. And that's not a good enough answer for me. And I think that just kind of drove me a bit away from it. Because I see a lot of work that I think is craft. And then there's a gallery that calls themselves Fine Art Gallery. And they show work right next to each other that has so little in common, it's just impossible to even put that in the same room. And I just see that too often in, um, the mainstream so far, the big galleries there, that I just can't really understand how these things have anything in common. And other than that, they're in glass, and I go to see glass exhibitions where the level of work, complexity of idea that is presented there is just so different that I don't, that one thing doesn't um, uplift the other. And I just kind of feel that way. Yeah, in the end, art has to get paid for. Um, and every art market and every art sub-market has a particular social and economic structure that channels things in, in various directions. And art is one of the more conservative, um, more constrained versions of that. Um, and there's a whole lot of kind of complex reasons that you can get into why that is. Um, but the end result is that um, there's a very particular product that, that is sought, you know, and it's sold by the Heller Gallery or Habitat or, you know, all of these things. And uh, if you like that and you like to make that, you're in luck. Um, <laughs> if you want to do something else, then your funding options for the kind of traditional gallery model of working as an artist uh, are going to be very slim. And that's kind of, uh, that's just one of the ways things are. And uh, I kind of, I actively have been doing some work to try to change that a little bit. Um, I gave an hour long lecture on it with uh, two of my friends uh, at the last gas conference. Um, they went over like a lead balloon, but you know, <laughs> that's how things go. Um, it actually went over pretty well, I think. I don't think anything's good change anything, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, that's kind of a, it's kind of a fact of life. Um, and it's not something that, uh, it, you know, it's not something you can just kind of like, okay, we're going to go this way now. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way, but slowly, hopefully things will start to expand a little bit more. Um, and I think kind of looking at the historical trajectory, it, uh, the market's probably ready for that expansion um, too. Yeah, I, th I feel so, that the group that Matt is actively involved in Hyperopia projects, um, they, they are, for me, right now, the only um, kind of pushing um, group composed of like relatively young artists that themselves want to change kind of the dynamic and want to make a platform that's a non-commercial for to to show a different style of work and it's not that the other is bad it has nothing to do with it it's just that they're, they're different things and it's hard to look at them in the same in the same light so it's just a way of trying to figure out what else could there happen and it's not that this is gonna no one knows where this is gonna go but it's just kind of a way of, of hoping to to change path and i i feel when you look at um the first um, glass program that um, was started, it wasn't a 
it wasn't in a craft department, it was in an art department, and it was, in a, it was a way of making sculpture. And then now a lot of the glass programs are craft programs, and they teach necessarily different skills, but they don't necessarily teach understanding to the students of, of that they have to make a clear choice in a way about where they're gonna go with their work and what are the places of in between craft and fine art that could exist or, you know, there's a certain sensibility that's missing. It's all gonna, just gonna thrown together in a big pot and called the big stew of glass art. And, and that's kind of probably like a wish to, to find your own place, I think, is that group. Yeah, I mean, you can kind of extend that to doing anything, you know, making television shows, whatever you want to. Um, it's just the narrower the field, the more constrained those options get. And class is a very specific kind of thing. Hmm. Welcome. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. That was good. I don't think I have anything to say. <laughs> I mean, how do you maybe how do you feel about it coming from a whole different um, well, entry point? Well, I, it's sort of been a relief to me, to be honest with you. Like, I mean, because stepping, but I've realized like what you're saying, I completely agree with. It's like, uh, it, but I got so sick of the fine art world, and you know what led me to go to this art school that I went to originally was because I didn't want to make paintings that I thought were crappy. And it seemed like that was kind of what was happening then. So maybe I was interested in craft all along mm -hmm. in a way, but or at least speaking with a you know a good vocabulary as opposed yeah. to just you know local dialect, which seemed to be what was the case in a lot of the stuff going on in New York in the '80s. And then you know it's pretty easy to get jaded about the big open art market when you have people who are like the person who got Margaret Thatcher elected making major decisions about who's successful in the art world. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of stepping out of that, not like I was really in it, but not trying to play that game anymore and coming over to the other side. Um, it's kind of been a relief because I'm not, it's like I'm thinking what I want to think. I'm not like caught up in like, I don't know, some kind of weird juggling game mm -hmm. of bullshit. But I can see that there is still just as much of that. And I did spend two years making work that wasn't going to sell at all. I mean, you, you want to buy a pile of sticks, be my guest. But um, <laughs> that, uh, so that was, it's, that is, those are all issues that are important to me in terms of, you know, thinking about art in a greater way. And I think, and I guess also going to ANU, I expected a lot more critical dialogue there than I found, which was a kind of a surprise, mm -hmm. you know. But, uh, uh, I, and I still thirst for it. So yeah, I don't, you know, I'm part of an art reading group and mm -hmm. I don't, so I don't, I guess I'm, I found a happy medium between the two. You yeah, know? and I think that's what I'm looking for yeah. With, yeah. with what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Well, you can join our art reading. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Come down from Seattle. Yeah. Where we can meet halfway. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's kind of where, where probably all the three of us stand, that we would like to have a happy meeting between um, critical dialogue and, and the dialogue about craft, because the dialogue about craft is important and is valuable and is something that's, at least for Matt and myself, I know a really important um, part of what we, what how we think. Yeah. We think through our hands mm -hmm. and making, and that's necessarily thinking through craft. And, and right. it is an important part, but it has to go by, beyond that. And I think that's where, what we're pushing for. Right, adding the content yeah. to that. Great. Well, I unless there's any burning questions out there, I think uh, it, we can conclude this. I want to thank the panelists and thank all of you for joining us today. So, thanks, thanks for having you. us. Thank you.